Good evening, I'm Clarissa McLean, and thank you so much for joining us for Rallying Together for Students, Families, and Our Community. We are so excited to engage with parents and families within the Randolph School community and across North Alabama. Like you, we are missing that in-person connection, but we are going to embrace these opportunities to still gather virtually and connect on digital platforms. So first I would like to thank our event sponsor, Silver Linings Neurodevelopment, as well as Metropolitan Disc Jockey for providing the live stream services. And as a reminder, this is the first of four events in the Rallying Together series. And we're gonna host these every Tuesday night during the month of February at 6.30 p.m. So if you haven't already, you can register for the upcoming events on randolphschool.net. And our website is also a place to learn about our K through 12 programs, tailored tuition, get a glimpse into student life, watch our virtual tours, or you can also schedule a campus tour. So as you may have seen in the presentation on our website prior to this live stream starting, we really want this to be interactive. So you can send your questions via text now or during the presentation if our presenter says something that you want to inquire about. So here are the instructions. You text our school, all capital letters, 482 to 22333. I'm going to repeat that again. Text our school, 482 to 22333. You will also see that periodically show up during the presentation as well. So now I'm going to introduce our featured speaker tonight. Leela Neighbors is a licensed professional counselor with the Alabama Institute for Mindfulness. For more than 15 years, Neighbors has been working with adults and teenagers in private practice and undergone extensive training and education in mindfulness-based stress reduction. Mindfulness-based interventions in psychotherapy, mindfulness-based eating, as well as mindful sports performance enhancement. Neighbors is also a former Randolph teacher and the parent of Fran Hudson, an alum from uh, 2018, and Emma Hudson, a uh, current student in the class of 2021. So Leela, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you, Clarissa, uh, very much for that introduction. And um, it is really an honor to be here uh, tonight at Randolph School, an honor to be with you to share something that I am so incredibly uh, passionate about. And um, one of the reasons that I am so passionate about mindfulness and stress reduction and self-care is because of my own personal journey. Um, I had a um, health scare um, uh, that involved um, uh, lung disease uh, about uh, 10 or 11 years ago and was on uh, medication. I was on prednisone, which uh, made me feel like my, all of my insides were jumping 24-7. Uh, um, uh, I was just ha on this vibration, and it wasn't a, a good vibration. Um, so that was when, in earnest, I began to pay attention to many things, but one of those things I began to really spend more energy and devote time to was my mindfulness practice, um, which includes, uh, yes, meditation, but it also includes uh, very simple practices that each of us do every day, and I'll get more into that later. But it was only through using um, um, my meditation practice as a focus and um, um, practicing on a daily basis that I was really able to settle down, so to speak, um, uh, settle down from the standpoint that I didn't feel like I was on that high vibration all the time and settle down from the standpoint so um, I could fall asleep at night. Um, because if, if you, any of you have been on prednisone, you know sometimes that is uh, a, me a medication that is, can be very helpful, but it can also um, impact uh, many other things. So yes, this is something I'm very passionate about, mindfulness and uh, self-care. And what I want to do tonight is um, uh, share some information with you, but more importantly, maybe some tips and techniques um, some ideas that you can take and use as your own. You can take and you can um, be creative with them and maybe morph them into something that's totally yours. So the whole purpose of this is to give you information about self-care, uh, stress reduction, and mindfulness, but it's very much um, uh, the objective 
for me, anyway, as a presenter, is for you to come away with something. Um, and even if it's a seed that's planted that you pick up six months from now. So without further ado, we'll get to the uh, body of the program. So um, what is self-care? Other than the title of this presentation, what is self-care? I put two definitions uh, you might see on the in front of you right now. Um, and there are many out there, and, but these are just general uh, definitions that seem to be appropriate for what we're um, investigating tonight. So self-care is any activity that we do deliberately, and that's a key word in, in regard to our presentation. It's any uh, activity that we do deliberately in order to take care of our mental, emotional, and physical health. And the second definition um, that uh, I'm using tonight, it, it, the only real difference um, between the two is that this one says that self-care describes a conscious act. And that's really important. It's a conscious act one takes in order to prom promote their own physical, mental, and emotional health. So um, the idea of this deliberate um, effort, this deliberate plan on our part to um, practice good self-care is really important here tonight. It, it also gives us a great deal of power. If it is deliberate on our part and if it is conscious on our part, it is within our control to um, be able to impact uh, this idea of care for ourselves, be, uh, be able to um, control uh, uh, parts of our physical, mental, and emotional health. So um, the next slide that you're looking at, if you've ever uh, gotten on an airplane, you have probably seen this uh, many times before in some fashion or form. The idea behind self-care, um, using this metaphor, when you get on an airplane, you might hear some of the most um, important words that you've ever heard in your life. And those words are, should the cabin lose pressure, uh, an oxygen mask will drop down. It may look like air is not flowing, but they assure us that it is in fact. But the next words that the flight attendant speaks are probably the most important. And those words are, before you attempt to help anyone else, before you attempt to put that oxygen mask on anyone else, place it on yourself. Because the potential there is, if you do um, try to put it on everyone else first, you might run out of oxygen and you might um, die or pass out and then really be unable to help anyone, especially if it's somebody that's older or a child that, that needs your help. So this is a really good metaphor too because we have a, a parent in the picture here. I keep pointing up, I'm sorry, but there's a parent in the a picture on the, um, uh, on the card on the airplane, usually of a child, of that mother trying to help her child first. But if that parent or mother or grandparent, if that person who is trying to help others doesn't take care of themselves first, then all is lost. And we have to move away from this idea that self-care is selfish. Because self-care really is, and if we're bold enough to do it and to, courageous enough to practice our own self-care, then we really um, enhance and improve our ability to help those around us. We become a, a better version of ourselves because we are taking good care of ourselves. So uh, the heart, the human heart, pumps blood to itself before any other part of the body. Another really good metaphor for self-care, that uh, the heart itself knows that it has to take care of itself. It has to be oxygenate, oxygenated. It has to have that um, blood supply that supplies oxygen in order to do what the heart needs to do for the for the human body. So it's a very nice um, metaphor, both of these, uh, for the idea of self-care. Of course, remembering too that 
when you're on an airplane and the oxygen mask comes down, that truly is an emergency situation. We want to be in the place where when we are practicing self-care, uh, the plane's not going down. We want to be in a situation where um, we're practicing a good self-care all of the time and maintaining our uh, physical, mental, and emotional help, health, and it doesn't come to the plane going down or an emergency situation or a crisis um, or absolute burnout from something that we've been doing. So self-care is an ongoing practice and something that each of us can really um, do a little bit at a time, moment by moment, and, and day by day. So, there is um, an important thing to be aware of in regard to this magnificent human body that we all came to the planet in, and that is that it responds to stress whether we want it to or not. Um, years ago, the term stress response was coined, and what that means is that it's really a reaction that the body has, not so much a response. And we'll get into that a little more. There's a difference between reacting and responding. Reacting indicates like a knee-jerk reaction when the physician taps uh, your knee to check your reflexes. Uh, responding indicates a more thoughtful um, uh, approach to something. So there are certain physiological things that happen in regard to stress, and they happen in the body whether we want them to or not, and many of these responses are um, totally out of our control. We have little or no control over, but that's not, that's not, not everything necessarily. Um, for instance, I can often come to stillness, even right now while my heart is racing in the beginning of this uh, presentation, um, I can take a few breaths and actually feel um, a sense of uh, calm start to come over my body or my heart rate lower. So there are some things in regard to the stress response that we might can um, have an influence on. But sometimes uh, the particular stressors in our lives are very short-lived and sometimes they are more long-term, much like caring for um, an elderly parent or uh, someone with disabilities or special needs child, or being involved in an ongoing relationship that's not uh, supportive to your well, well-being. So, you know, stressors can be very short-lived, like an exam if you're in high school or college, um, or it can be a um, presentation such as this or a presentation at work. So there is a biological response to any perceived threat. And um, that's kind of wired into our fight or flight uh, mechanism in the, in the body. But even if it's a perceived threat, so, and it doesn't have to necessarily be a perceived threat to my physical well-being. We used to talk about post-traumatic stress um, in the context of if somebody was on the battlefield or thought they were going to die. Uh, but, but a perceived threat can be uh, many things. It can be um, a uh, threat to my social standing, can have the same physiological response. I can have some of the same responses in my body to that as I would uh, a physical threat. Um, it can be a threat to my world view. It can be a threat to uh, my religious beliefs. So there, uh, it's not just a, ma a matter of being in fear for my life. Uh, especially when you consider the modern world, we don't see the saber-toothed tiger too often anymore, but there are still, nonetheless, many threats that we encounter um, on a daily basis. Traffic um, here in Huntsville being one of them when you get up in the morning and you're heading to work. Uh, oftentimes you get to work and your shoulders are up around your ears and you didn't even realize what was happening, that you had a death grip on the steering wheel. So this idea of a perceived threat becomes very important to what we are uh, talking about uh, tonight. So I want to mention um, 
this idea of fight or flight because this is a, we're hardwired into us. This is a, a primitive fight, fa flight, or flee. You may have um, heard of this. This is a, um, a primitive part of the what we might call the reptilian brain. Um, it, it is it is a response that, from an evolutionary standpoint, has is what has allowed us to be here. So that when the saber-toothed tiger did jump out from behind the rock. Um, we went into fight or flight. So the body, the physiology of the body, when that adrenaline is, kicks in the body, many things happen when we are, when we perceive a threat. And so um, one of those things that happened is, is that uh, the heart rate increases and blood pressure. Um, the pupils dilate so you can see better. The skin, blood is shunted away from the surface of the skin and actually from the core of the body too. Um, a lot of it is into the large muscles of the legs and arms. So you can either run away from that predator or you can uh, stand and fight. Um, and you, uh, all the cortisol, all the hormones are being dumped into the body and um, different things are happening. The smooth muscles relax so you can get more oxygen into the lungs, uh, as well as uh, non-essential systems being shut down. If I am getting ready to be con uh, consumed uh, by the saber-toothed tiger, I don't need to digest my lunch. My immune system becomes unnecessary under stress because my body is marshalling everything to take care of me so I can fight and be strong or I can flee and be strong and run fast. So uh, the body really does a miraculous job of taking care of us. And, um, uh, but if we don't understand how this fight or flight works, when we encounter in modern times, and we do every day, because that is how stress is built up in the human body. Uh, even something as simple as focusing on uh, small tasks, we lose that ability under this kind of stress and pressure when we're in, we're in uh, flight, or, uh, flight or fight mode. Um, the other thing to think about in regard to uh, stress and flight or fight is that I mentioned traffic a little bit earlier and if you think about it when you get up in the morning and you're rushing around to get ready for work taking care of your family you might have um, uh, God forbid uh, a crossword with your spouse or your children or um, you might uh, have one of your creatures in your house may have had an accident on the floor. So that's, one of, that's a ping right there. That's a, a, a small stressor. You get out and get to the car, into the car. You notice the, ga the, the car is out of gas and you have to stop. You hadn't counted on that. That's another ping, another little stressor uh, on the brain, ping. And uh, then you get in traffic and somebody pulls out in front of you and you know um, you have to slam on the brakes and all that adrenaline is coursing through the body because you were scared you were going to rear into the car. And so that's another ping on the brain. Then you get to work and a report is late. And then later on in the day uh, you find out that um, your child has uh, failed an exam and they and prepare for it. And so that's another ping. So in our modern world, we are constantly bombarded and this stress reactivity or this stress response where it's engaged all the time. Unlike in the times, uh, primitive times, you know, the caveman man or woman, uh, the primitive people, when something would happen, they would expend that energy. They would run from the saber-toothed tiger or they would fight it and all that energy would be expended. For, for the modern humans, um, that we, we hold on to that energy all day. And we usually hold on to it without even realizing that it is um, being held in the body. So you can see how over time that can take quite a toll on us. So it's important to acknowledge these small things. They're not 
life altering or earth shattering, but it is actually this layering you of one thing on top of another. And it's uh, the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. Something may happen at the end of the day or I get home and I have a, a blowout or a knockdown drag out with my spouse or my child. Or uh, at the end of the day at work, um, I'm, I'm short and irritable with a colleague. It can manifest in, in many different ways. Um, so just this awareness of how the modern person is um, has we have our foot on the gas all the time. You know, we're always having our foot on the gas and very seldom, unless we do it consciously, do we put our foot on the brake. So, it, and, and physiologically, the body is in that high stress mode of always ready. And we need to have those moments of um, resting and restoring so we can not only feel better and think more clearly, but so our immune system has time to, uh, we, we cultivate a resilience, not only a uh, uh, resilience emotionally and mentally, but uh, the body is also resilient. And the, um, the uh, less stress that, uh, the less stress impacts me, uh, the more able I am to fight off that germ that's uh, floating around here. Or, um, uh, you know, COVID is a great example of this. In times of uh, pandemic such as this, self-care is absolutely critical. Self-care is the thing that may um, really help you get through this um, unscathed. Maybe we'll all be different but um, uh, hopefully our lives won't be altered uh, forever um, in a way that is detrimental to our well-being. So bringing awareness to the fact, and, and we all hear this cliche, it has become a cliche now, these unprecedented times, but we need to bring our attention to this. We need to not stuff it down and push it away to try to forget about it, but we need to know, hey, this is a difficult time. This is a hard time. And uh, the important thing about that is it reminds us of our common humanity. This is a global epidemic. COVID is a global epidemic that is a pandemic that is um, mutating and things are happening. We watch the news. So there's, you know, we're constantly being uh, bombarded with information. But the thing about this is probably more than anything else, this pandemic can teach us about our common humanity. What common humanity is, and, and it's very important because um, one of the things that may affect us uh, a great deal during COVID, um, me as an adult, my children, uh, people that are older than I am, one of the things that impacts us is isolation. I'm not able to go meet my friends for coffee and do things that I've been able to do. It, you know, we get together through Zoom, but it's a little, it's a bit different. So there can be this sense, and some people don't have that access. So there is this uh, creeping sense of isolation, and we are more isolated than we were a year ago or um, um, 14 months ago. We are, are more isolated now than we were. But what the pandemic has really taught me and driven home is this idea of common humanity. We have more alike and we are more alike. We have more in common and we're more alike than we really give ourselves credit for. And I'm not talking about the clothes we wear. I'm not talking about what music we listen to or anything like that. We, have, we are more alike and we recognize our common humanity now because we're all fearful we, we all know what it feels like to be anxious about our personal health and the health of our family. That is something that we, that we share in common. But uh, common humanity goes deeper than that. It goes to this idea that sometimes um, you may never have felt this way, but it goes to the idea of, oh, gee, I thought I was the only person that felt that way. You know, and then we have a conversation with somebody and they express a similar idea. Or that 
people feel like they don't belong. I mean, how many of us at different points in our lives have felt like uh, we don't belong? How many of us have felt that way? And, and yet we're hardwired for belonging. It is critical to us. So that is another part of our, uh, our common humanity. So, so the pandemic is a teacher in many ways. And this idea of common humanity for me has kind of been um, um, driven home and something that I think about quite a bit, especially when some pretty strong emotions come up for me. So I want to stop for a minute or, or uh, for one moment and um, talk about this idea of mindfulness or what mindfulness is because this topic is self-care and mindfulness um, in the time of COVID-19. So um, the definition that's used most uh, in the world that's most often quoted is this definition by John Kabat-Zinn. Mindfulness is the awareness that arises when you pay attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. That's a lot, but if we look at it and we break it down, um, we can learn a lot by looking at this uh, sentence. And it, it informs what we're going to be talking about tonight quite a bit. So mindfulness is the awareness that arises. And I use the Webster Dictionary uh, definition of awareness. So awareness is the quality or, of state or state of being aware. Knowledge and understanding that something is happening or it exists. Awareness is the quality of, of st or state of being aware. It's knowledge and understanding that something is happening or exists. So mindfulness is the awareness that arises when I begin to um, uh, be aware of something, whether it's in this moment, aware of my nervousness and maybe stumbling over some words. So I am, awareness is arising for me in regard to that. So the, another part of this definition is Mindfulness is the awareness that arises when you pay attention in a particular way. And that particular way I've uh, added to the definition, that particular way is with kindness and curiosity. So mindfulness is the awareness that arises when you pay attention in a particular way. That's with kindness and curiosity on purpose because we talked about self-care being deliberate earlier. So this, uh, this paying attention on purpose in a particular way, in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So we're paying attention to the present moment and non-judgmentally. That doesn't mean that um, we stop thinking, this idea of non-judgment. What it means is that the mind is constantly uh, liking and not liking things. Um, I like the temperature in here, or I don't like the temperature in here. I like what somebody's saying on TV, or I don't. I like what one of my children is doing, or I don't. I like what this person has said. So this idea of liking and disliking, that's the mind is constantly making judgments in that regard. And most of the time, we are unaware of them. So this idea of mindfulness um, one component of it is bringing our attention to this quality of mind, this mind that's constantly judging. So we're bringing an attitude of non-judgment. In other words, I notice that I am not liking something in the moment, and is it possible for me to step back from that and witness, <laughs> not to witness the judging mind doing its thing? Is it possible for me to step back? And so it brings that quality of witnessing the activity of my own mind, which is very important. Because have you ever been blindsided by an emotional outburst or blindsided by a feeling? Usually that happens when we don't pay attention to what's going on in our minds. So um, this idea of non-judgment is really more about um, 
being aware of the mind constantly judging and liking and not liking, is it possible for me to be with just what's here in this moment without saying, oh, I like this, or that, or, and to be with what really is here? The room is cold, so my hands are cold. Instead of, oh, this is awful terrible, this room is cold, I don't like it. But we can be with what is and what really is here in our lives without letting the uh, mind uh, run wild, so to speak, without letting the mind um, create all these judgments and we happen to accept each one of them as the absolute truth. So we're paying attention in mindfulness to what goes on in the mind. So there are benefits to mindfulness that have been um, studied. And in the last 20 years, you know, um, mindfulness probably um, in the late 70s when John Kabat-Zinn started the uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction program at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, nobody talked about mindfulness. Much less in Western uh, medical schools, mindfulness was not something that um, was part of the program, unlike now. Uh, mindfulness and mindfulness-based stress reduction are a part of many medical schools and um, colleges and universities have programs in mindfulness to support their students. But in the last 20 years, we've gone from not studying mindfulness to just this overabundance. Uh, more, more studies than I can read in my spare time. But um, it, what mindfulness does for us, some of the, the, um, some of the benefits uh, that are supported by these studies of mindfulness um, reduces stress. Those stressors we were talking about on this body uh, that we encounter every day. So mindfulness can help us reduce our uh, rate of stress. Reduces rumination. I, if I'm an anxious person and a worrier, it doesn't make it go away. It's not about making things go away. Mindfulness is not. It's about that changing my relationship to that anxiousness or that rumination. So it reduces rumination and it um, has been shown to improve working memory. That's pretty cool, especially for somebody my age. You know, as we're aging, that working memory really can take a beating, especially if we're not practicing, practicing self-care. So mindfulness has been shown to improve working memory. Also, improved attention and the ability to suppress distracting information. As, as somebody who still studies and reads and likes to, I like to set aside time to um, read some of these uh, studies and data in regard to mindfulness. And when I think about my children uh, studying, uh, practicing mindfulness improves working memory, but it also enables me to suppress distracting information things that I don't need to worry about right now. So that, you know, that, that's a very important benefit, no matter what age we are. It also decreases our emotional reactivity. Mindfulness has been shown to uh, that uh, reactivity we have, that it might be, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm still angry about something, something happens and I become angry, but I don't have an explosion of, uh, you know, um, of cuss words or, you know, I don't have this explosion of rage towards somebody. It, so mindfulness can help me um, with that emotional reactivity or to say something I regret, <laughs> that I respond in the immediate and say something that I really do uh, regret. Mindfulness has been shown to um, provide uh, help with uh, cognitive flexibility. Uh, it's been shown to enhance relationship satisfaction, uh, increased immune function. There is, I could do four or five more slides on studies uh, about what mindfulness has done. Um, but just know that there is so much information out there about how mindful, mindfulness can support us and what the benefits are of mindfulness. But people who practice mindfulness, they begin to recognize and identify thoughts, emotions, and body sensations. Why is that important? Um, 
We, we all think, uh, sitting here, uh, sitting at home, we all think that we can recognize our thoughts and emotions, but we really do go through a large portion of our day without paying any attention at all to what we're feeling. So uh, with mindfulness, we begin to recognize and identify thoughts, uh, thoughts that aren't supportive or thoughts that um, um, or, or emotions or sensations in the body. Sometimes I can know something. If my shoulders are up around my ears and I have a tightness in my shoulders when I get to work, if my awareness comes to the, that sensation in my body, I might realize, hey, I'm a little uptight here. I'm, I'm a little stressed. So those sensations can give me really good warning about what's happening. And I, but the, it's very important that I pay attention to that. Um, it can also um, help people have a better understanding of how thoughts and uh, feelings and body sensations relate to our behaviors. We have a thought, we act on it as if it is the truth. Mindfulness kind of reminds us that a thought is just a thought. It is not necessarily the absolute truth. And our emotions, uh, some studies have shown that our emotions last for about 90 seconds unless we pile or toss kerosene on the fire. You know, oh, you shouldn't have said that to me. That's awful, terrible. How dare you talk to me that way? So there's so many ways that mindfulness can help us in the regular comings and goings of our daily living. And when I think, what I think is one of the most important uh, things about mindfulness, at least it is for me, and what I've noticed over the course of my practice, is I'm moving toward an ability to respond rather than react. Um, the knee-jerk reactions that I have in my life, um, oh, they're still there. <laughs> they're deeply ingrained. They're still there. But I'm beginning to notice them, and that distance between that instant that I want to react and when I can take that pause for a moment and not react but respond, often my response Think about it when you get angry or you say something. Oftentimes your immediate reactivity is not really what you value, think, or believe. It is just a habitual reactivity. Somebody says something, I feel hurt, and meow, I react and I hurt back. So mindfulness helps us not to be quite so um, reactive. So I am going to kind of deviate from the slides. Somehow or another, my slides are not quite in the order that I hoped they would be in. But I'm going to engage you in something. Um, and I think you can use a little bit of your imagination here. So this is a practice that you can use, a mindfulness practice that you can use anywhere, anytime. Um, so I want you, you don't have to close your eyes, but in your mind's eye, I want you to see a stop sign just like what you encounter on the street every day. You know, that red thing that has the letters stop on it. And we attend to it um, mostly. Sometimes I have been known to roll a stop sign. But anyway, uh, we attend to that stop sign when we're driving a, a car. So see that as clearly as you can in your mind's eye for a moment. Big red stop sign with right letters. So this practice is called the stop practice. So S, no matter what you're doing, stands for stop. And if you're at a stop sign in your car, this is a great time to practice it because you're doing that anyway. So you stop, or if you're, you're at home doing something, you can stop where you are too. So S, stop. T is take a breath. So do that now, if you would, kind of a little deeper than what you normally would. Just. And observe what's going on with you right now. You might be having thoughts about wishing this presentation was something a little different or going faster. Or you might be having thoughts about dinner, just observing. You might notice, oh, there's a pain in my low back. So just observe, observing what's present for you right now. And the P stands for proceed. So that's the entirety of the stop practice. So you come to a stop sign or even a traffic light because you have time to do this. See in your mind's eye the stop sign. Stop. Take a breath. 
observe what's going on. My heart rate is still beating kind of fast, and I'm noticing I'm still speaking kind of fast because I'm excited to be here speaking with you. But now I can proceed. And the interesting thing about that one breath is there is some research about the fact that when we take one long, slow, deep breath, that it actually toggles, you know, it kind of toggles a switch in the brain, I suppose you could say. We go from if I'm in traffic and I'm, you know, watching out for the other guy and I'm being very vigilant and very uptight, when I take that deep breath, I toggle from that primitive brain, which can be kind of aggressive too, to my prefrontal cortex. And so I'm in my right mind, so I'm in my thinking mind. I'm where I want to be. So the stop practice is just a very simple um, um, thing, a mindfulness practice that you can do every day. You don't have to sit on a cushion and meditate for 30, 45 minutes or an hour. This is about weaving mindfulness into your day, being aware of what's going on in your life. So... Um, this uh, next slide that you're looking at is an excerpt from the um, mindfulness-based stress reduction curriculum. And it's really important. It kind of shocks people sometimes when they realize this. It's not the stressors per se, but how you handle them that influence the short and long-term health effects they may have on your mind, body, and overall sense of health and well-being, they being the stressors. So it's not the stressors themselves. Because we have people, people who experience the exact same thing, and they experience it in a totally different way. So it's not the stressor that influences or impacts our health, per se, that impacts our mind, our body. And that stressor can be anything from a diagnosis of cancer to um, so it is how we handle or how we meet those stressors that become very important. There's a lot of power in that, isn't it? It's not what happens to me, it's how I meet it. That's the beauty of this self-care and mindfulness. We oftentimes give up our power because, you know, I had a bad day at work because my boss did X, you know. But how we meet that stressor can really um, uh, change how it impacts and influences us. And this is this this idea has come up before, and I want, but it, it really is important. We are conditioned to react habitually and often very ineffectively to stress. We are conditioned. And that's really important that we, that witness, you know, stepping back and sometimes watching our behaviors. Am I reacting out of my automatic habitual reactivity? And most of the time when I get into trouble, the answer to that is yes. When there's an argument in my home, when I am out in the public and I notice that I'm angry about something or irritated about uh, being in the line and, and being in a hurry, uh, I notice that that is a habitual response. And so this can be very, very helpful. Um, so mindfulness can help us uh, learn to mitigate this stress reactivity. It, can, it doesn't make anything go away, but it can help us as we engage with uh, these stressors that impact us. Um, and we can also... Uh, explore, mindfulness hel helps us explore the negative impacts of stress and really many times reducing the impact of that negative stress on us. And uh, the last thing I want to mention is that mindfulness can help people engage in increasingly, increasingly um, a participatory role in their own health care. Oftentimes, um, well, their health care, their health and well-being, but you know, being a participant in your own health care is really important. And um, um, so what it does for us in the short term in regard to self-care, it helps us to uh, cultivate more effective ways of responding and moving through the world. 
it also helps us to be a much more active partner with the physicians who, who, who care for us and the health care uh, providers that work with us. So when we talk about self-care, the areas that need our attention are the areas that we may think of when we talk about self-care. Because we talk about certain things like you know diet and exercise and things like that, but there are different aspects of a self or different domains, if you will. And uh, this body, this physical body, uh, my mind or my thoughts or, or the mental aspect of my life and my experience, the emotional self, uh, the spiritual aspects, as well as uh, the social that we mentioned a little bit earlier. So uh, these need um, attention and they need uh, care and um, when we are not only at the end of our rope, so to speak, but if we can avoid burnout, if we can, um, at the end of the year, you know, when uh, teachers are tired or at the end of a long day um, or a long uh, pandemic, healthcare workers that are really struggling. So if we can practice self-care and that helps mitigate uh, we can pr practice mindfulness and self-care, and it helps mitigate the impact of stress on the body, on the mind, um, on, on the emotional self, as well as the spirit, the spiritual self. So um, there are many ways that you can, you can think of uh, ways that are important to you. This is a very individual thing. I could name things that um, you should do this, you should do that, you should... but. In general, we know taking care of this body is an important uh, part of, of um, a, a very important part of our uh, well-being. And along with that goes the mental aspect or the uh, emotional and, and, and spiritual. So uh, in the spiritual aspect can be everything from going to church to meditating to uh, taking a walk in the woods and also the social. Clarissa, excuse me. You know I'm going for an hour. Did you know that? Okay, I didn't know. Okay. Um, so uh, we, we could really you know, name, you need to eat this and from these groups and you need to have a low fat diet, Mediterranean diet might be the best. You need to exercise X amount of time every day. But a lot of this is really quite personal. And so you know yourself. And so taking active uh, steps in your self-care, what works for you when you're under a great deal of stress or you are feeling um, um, like you are teetering on the edge of burnout or you are feeling not quite yourself, what would be helpful for you? Everything, it, for me, it might be to uh, take a walk. It might be, uh, I might be in a situation where I am in a meeting or, or, or um, speaking like this and I can't take a walk right now. But what I can do is take a deep intentional breath. And that in and of itself is a form of self-care. So the other side of this is how important it is for you, you, me, all of us, to have a plan for care, for self-care that is ongoing. Um, we can do things that are temporary. I can go out with a friend to dinner. That can lift my spirits. But that is a temporary thing. So there are enduring um, uh, steps that we can take that help us um, across a long period of time. Uh, uh, and really, uh, we woven into the fabric of our life, so to speak, to borrow from the cotton commercial. But um, we want to weave these um, these ideas and these practices of self-care into our everyday uh, being. So uh, I want to take just a moment to, um, for us to do a practice. So if you're at home, what I'd like for you to do is to um, just, if you're sitting down, just get comfortable, maybe sit with both feet on the floor. And we're going to do a brief uh, mindfulness practice. If you're more comfortable standing um, or if you're lying down, that's fine too. It's not the position that the body's in. It's more your attitude or intention. So for right now, um, just be
being comfortable in your chair and allowing your eyes to close. And we've been talking a great deal about self-care and mindfulness and this idea of bringing attention. So bring your attention now to what's going on for you. Noticing your mental activity, your emotional climate, so to speak, maybe sensations in the body, everything from tension and tightness to hunger or a sense of ease in the muscles. So what's here? And just as best you can, noticing what's here with, without trying to change anything, just kind of like doing an inventory of what is. Mental activity, emotions, sensations. And now narrowing your attention to the breath coming and going in the body. You might notice the breath at the tip of the nose. You might notice it at the nostrils, the back of the throat or the chest or the belly. But just bringing your attention to the breath, breathing in and breathing out with awareness, not trying to do anything. Maybe taking a couple of deeper, more full breaths. And now expanding your attention to the body once again. Feeling the body whole and complete as it is in this moment. You might notice the uh, touch of cool air on your skin or the sensation of light even coming through the eyes, even if they are closed. You may notice the pressure of the feet on the floor or the seat in the chair. Expanding your attention a little more to include the sounds. Sounds in the room, sounds, sounds in your body. You may notice the beating of your heart or the gurgling of your stomach. sound of the HVAC system. So without reaching out to anything on the soundscape, see if you can just be a receiver in this body. And as you're ready, opening your eyes, taking a, a deeper breath. That's a brief example of a short mindfulness uh, practice that you can do in a minute or five minutes. And it just starts with bringing awareness to your thoughts, emotions, and body sensations, narrowing your attention to the breath coming and going in the body, and expanding it once again um, to the body, the whole body, as well as um, the space around the body, uh, which includes the movement of air or sounds in the room. So this idea of self-care and mindfulness is not, I mean, it is uh, wonderful to have a practice where you um, um, do yoga for an hour, um, three days a week, or you, and then on the other days you meditate for 30, 45 minutes. But uh, many people, that, is, that kind of mindfulness practice is very difficult to do on a regular basis. So the most important thing is not how long you do it, it's that you do it often. And it's that stop practice that we did, and there are many, many out there. I, you know, we could spend this hour and another hour and another hour going over practices that you could do. But you know, because of the internet, I think it's... Um, um, kind of a, a waste of, of time to go through that because it's easily accessible to you. 
But what I want to emphasize to you is it's not about how long you do it. It's about um, small practices many times a day. Even if you do the stop practice when you get in your car and go to work in the morning or go to school in the morning, or on your way home you do the stop practice. Or if you just notice and do the practice we just did, it's kind of like an hourglass, expanding to your thoughts, emotions, noticing what's there and your body, and then going to the breath, and then expanding back out again. That can be done in a minute or three minutes. So weaving these practices in your day. Being present, when you get up in the morning, you take a shower. We spend lots of money on great soaps and fragrances and stuff, and yet we're in the shower thinking about school or work or a conversation we've had with somebody. Be where you are. Be present. Be present. And, you know, it is, that is a mindfulness practice. It is mindfulness in the well, in our daily activities. Be mindful while you're washing dishes, walking the dog, taking out the garbage. Be present. Those are practices. And then it helps us be present with our children. When they're telling us stories, we're tired. Um, they're telling us stories about their day, and sometimes we just kind of want to nod off to sleep. Or, or uh, this, our mindfulness practice helps engage and be with and be fully present for our kids. We get off automatic pilot. You know, just as we can get in the car and go to work and not have seen anything on the way to work, not remember how we get there. How many moments or how much of our lives is spent on automatic pilot? So self-care and mindfulness, these ideas uh, and self-care um, uh, Kristen Neff, who is a self-compassion researcher, um, says that um, self-care in difficult times really is self-compassion. So in these difficult times, let us practice more self-care. Let us be more self-compassion and not uh, caught up in the idea that it is selfish. You can be more supportive to your family, your colleagues, colleagues at work. You can do a better job when you are practicing good self-care, when you're taking care of yourself. When your tank is running on fumes, when you're running on empty, as the song says, it's very difficult to be there for all the people in your life. But self-care and mindfulness allow us uh, to do that. So remembering the stop practice is part of what uh, we have um, touched on tonight. And let that, if nothing else pops up for you in the next number of weeks, let the stop practice be a moment where you pause and see if you can weave that into your day. This quote is a quote by Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor and uh, also a neurologist and a psychiatrist. But the fact that a Holocaust survivor says something like this is impressive in and of itself, but his body of work is pretty incredible. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Mindfulness allows us to sort of put a wedge in between stimulus and response. We're not that amoeba being poked and being reactive. Mindfulness and self-care allows us to create some space so we can move from reactivity to responding. So I'd like to finish with this. Um, saying that is attributed to John Kabat-Zinn. I think it was used in the 70s. I remember somebody on a surfboard on a poster in the late 60s and early 70s, but uh, this is attributed to him in this way. He says, you cannot control the sea, you cannot stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. So 
mindfulness and self-care help us cultivate the tools that we need to surf the waves of, li waves of life so they are not constantly flooding over us and pushing us under. I want to say that again. Mindfulness and self-care are the tools that help us cultivate. We learn to surf. We learn, they, they help us to be able to surf the waves and sometimes the waves in life, as you well know, in the midst of this pandemic, um, social unrest, the, sometimes the waves in life can be incredibly high. And sometimes the water, the surface of the water is smooth. And we can't control that. But we can learn to surf. So thank you for letting me be here with you tonight. And uh, thank you for your time and attention. Leela, thank you so much, and I appreciate your presentation, and we've actually been receiving some questions during your presentation. I'd like to try to get to a couple of those before we wrap up for the evening. Um, I know you mentioned frequency as something that's important with mindfulness exercises, but one of the questions was, is there a best time of day to practice mindfulness skill building? I'm going to ask you to say that once again. I'm hearing impaired, so I'm walking over here trying to be mindful of our social distance, distancing. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah, is there a best time of day to practice mindfulness uh, skill yeah, building? That's a great question because, uh, no, <laughs> it, it depends on you. Um, I, uh, practicing at night for me, I fall asleep. And the, uh, the object of mindfulness is to fall awake. <laughs> so for me, first thing in the morning, it also sets the tone for my day. But I would say just play with different times during the day. If you're going to sit and med meditate for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes, you know, try it in the morning. See how it influences your mood and your day. Or if you're having a hard time going to sleep at night, you can certainly um, look up a body scan, a short body scan line, and scan your body and see if that helps relax. So it may be, that's just something to play with. Be curious okay. about. Okay. Another question that we got was for someone that's learning to practice mindfulness, what tips might you offer to create habits or cues in the routine in life to remind us to pause? Are there any tools, any apps, you know, that people can use? <laughs> okay. You can set, I know a lot of people set reminders for mm -hmm. things on their watches. You can set an hourly reminder. Um, my watch has a breathe, uh, the iWatch has a breathe thing. You can set it so um, it, it, I forget what it's called when it, your phone taps you on the wrist like that, but it taps you and then you feel the, uh, tapping and you breathe in and you breathe out. So we have technological tools that we can use for that. Um, great reminders, uh, I'm talking to some physicians about uh, mindfulness and stress reduction and uh, mentioned to them, every time you put your hand on the door of the room and you know a, a new patient is gonna be on the other side of that door, take a deep full breath. Just take a, there are so many ways that we can set up our own cues and we can use technology or we can use a certain time of day or stop sign. They're just, they're, and it's what works best for you. It's what you'll do that you'll do regularly that matters. It's not um, any conventional wisdom on uh, anything is going to help everyone. So. Okay. Well, this series, we have a lot of parents, you know, that are watching. One of the questions was, how can parents avoid conditioning their children to react habitually or ineffectively to stress? Uh, um, how can parents, say that again? How can parents avoid conditioning their children to react habitually and ineffectively to stress? I think one of the ways is modeling, try, as best you can, modeling for your kids. When, you're no, when you notice you're reacting, like if you're, re, if you're with your child and you're reacting to them habitually, you know, if you're short with them because you're tired and you're just having that knee-jerk reactivity, calling your own self out, you know, and saying to your child, oh, wow, I notice I am reacting out of a habit, you know, and I'm just being short with you in this moment. Um, that that kind of modeling can be um, very powerful. So I would say, you know, with small children, very much it is the modeling. 
And as kids get older, we're having some dialogue about noticing these things when they are reactive. Or a child that has uh, a problem with impulsivity in school or uh, acting out, you know, being able to have some dialogue about that mm -hmm. and them notice what happens right before you, you know, you're going to, you notice you're going to be reactive to mm -hmm. something, you get angry. Or, mm -hmm. so, so talking to them through that. And are there some like exercises that parents can do with their children? Would Absolutely, that be helpful? and there's some great books out there. And I will be glad to, if you would like to email me, um, it's not up there, but it's um, my email address is ll, that's two L's, ll neighbors, n a b o r s at comcast.net. And you can just say that you. Um, heard this and you'd like some books for children. There's some really good ones out there. There's some not so good ones, but there's some really, really, really good ones that are easy to use and you don't have to be a therapist or a mindfulness expert. Mm -hmm. You're just a parent. Okay, one more question. Um, so I noticed even for myself during the exercise, I had a lot of mental distraction. You know, you're saying stay there, you know, focus. So if you're trying to do this and you're not somewhere where we have Alila <laughs> guiding us and saying the things, are, how can you make sure that you part are participating okay. in the activity properly? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, and um, when I teach a mindfulness class, toward the end of the class, people will start saying, well, you've been guiding us, you know. Mm -hmm. But I've also been increasing the, the silence in our practices together. So what you can do is find a good guided uh, um, meditation. Once again, if you're interested in that, there are several good websites. Tarbrock is one of them, but there's some, um, you know, some of the medical schools have really neat uh, uh, meditations for anxiety and depression. And if you, once again, if you'll email me, I'll send you those. I'll be glad to send you um, um, websites that you can go to and get free, um, absolutely free guidance and meditation. So uh, the, kind of the idea might be that um, you uh, do guidance maybe for a couple of weeks and you uh, listen to a guided meditation. And then one week try to be with your own uh, guidance for three minutes, or set an egg timer, or uh, set your watch, and um, try to uh, notice what happens. And a lot of people, I say, wow, it's horrible. I'm, you know, uh, I've heard the expression, my mind is like a bad neighborhood. I don't want to go there alone, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so this idea that, that uh, you know, the, um, the, the lack of a voice in your head. Uh, but it's really important to cultivate your own and, and begin to um, accept your own authority in that regard. And that's, that's something that you'll learn. Okay. So. Well, Leela, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for answering the questions and for that thoughtful presentation. We really appreciate it. And before we wrap up tonight, I just want to remind everyone that, you know, we do have upcoming events in the Rallying Together series. This was just the first one. So we really hope you can join us for future ones and encourage others to join us. All of them are free and you can just register on RandolphSchool.net. I'll quickly give you a summary of the upcoming events on February 9th. We have Kristen Scroggin with Gym Y Communications and a UAH Communications lecturer who's going to be discussing the topic of healthy communications between generations. On the 16th, we'll show the documentary Screenagers next chapter, followed by a panel discussion with Randolph School administrators. Um, that's going to be about digital citizenship and social media. And then on the 23rd, the series is going to conclude with a diversity, equity, and inclusion presentation with Ambassador Ruben Brigitte II, who is the Vice Chancellor and President of Swanee, the University of the South. So thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. We look forward to our upcoming events and have a great night.